Okay, so hello and konnichiwa minasan. I welcome you all to the our fourth session of IJBC IJL special lecture series which is started from uh, February 2020-22 which will last till December 2020-22. We are celebrating 70th anniversary of our diplomatic relationship between India and Japan. To celebrate this momentous year IJBC are organizing a lecture series by veteran speakers, panel discussion about India and Japan views, challenges, fireside chat with Shefali, where we will be able to listen to inspiring interviews. And of course, the most awaited event is Konnichiwa Pune 2022, uh, supported by Embassy of Japan, Delhi, Council General of Japan in Mumbai, Government of India, India-Japan Laboratories, Keio University, and sponsored by tutorbharat.com, Interjust India, Daiichi Japanese Language Solution, Akpur, uh, Fujitsu Consulting India, Japan Center of Excellence, Guwahati, Folks Month. So we hope to work together to forge a vibrant India-Japan relationship for our future generation. For more details and to watch our prior sessions, please do visit our website, www.org, uh, www.ijbc.org. I'm sorry. I request you all, please keep your mics off. Thank you. So this session will highlight development challenges through governmental and non-governmental perspectives with the first-hand account of nearly three decades. We will, we will be journeyed through JICA's Official Development Assisted Corporation, ODA, to India, such as urban railways in metropolitan cities, road connectivity in northeastern region, water supply, environment uh, improvement, and human resource development that has significantly contributed in strengthening the bilateral relations between India and Japan. Experiences and lessons through grassroots initiatives and interactions, as well as voluntary actions in India, would give us an insight about India's new challenges, potentials, and innovative approaches that can help Japan to increase cooperation in India in the years to come. So let's listen to the highlights from our today's guest, our first guest is Mr. Ichiguchi Tomohide, Deputy Director General, South Asia Department, Japan International Corporation Agency, JICA. Introducing him further, Mr. Tomohide Ichiguchi has resided, uh, has dedicated his entire career of uh, career to infrastructure development and poverty elevation, mainly in South Asia. Since he joined a public organization for development corporation under the government of Japan in 1995. He has been working for the Japan International Corporation Agency, JICA, since October 2008, which is one of the largest development partners for financial and technical corporation to the developing countries and annually provides the developing countries with more than US $20 billion. He is a Deputy General Director, South Asia Department, since November 2020 which is uh, responsible for socio-economic analysis, preparation of country-wise corporation strategy, coordination and formulation, and monitoring of JICA incorporated by develop, development of projects in South Asia. Before the current assignments, he was a senior director of Gen, uh, General Affairs Department uh, March 2019 to October 2021. Director of Loan Procurement Policy and Supervision, Direct, uh, Supervision Division, March 2016 to November 2018. Deputy Chief Representative of JICA India Office, March 2013 to March 2016. A Country Director for Bangladesh and Nepal in South Asia Department, uh, January 2011 to December 2012. He gained his master's degree from Cornell University, US, and bachelor's degree from University of Tokyo. So we are eagerly waiting to listen to you, uh, Mr. Ichiguchi. So over to you. Yorosh Konegaishimas. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Ichiguchi Tomohide, um, Deputy Director General, South Asia Department, uh, JICA. Um, the quite the detail um, safe introduction, uh, introduction uh, was already made. So I will uh, jump into the um, topics of my presentation. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, today's uh, presentation, I'd like to cover uh, three topics, starting with trends of JICA's cooperation to India, 
Second, JICA's noticeable cooperation projects in India, including uh, five sectors. Then, um, development challenges in India and JICA's future cooperation. So first of all, trends of JICA's cooperation to India. So I'd like to talk about the history of JICA's cooperation to India. But before that, let me briefly explain uh, what is JICA and also Japan's official development assistance. JICA is taking care of most of Japanese ODA, official development assistance, under Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Government Japan. We are taking care of three major ODA tools, which are technical cooperation, grant aid, and all year long. In addition, we also provide cooperation to private sector. In fact, technical cooperation, grant aid, all year long is for the government in developing countries. But in addition, we provide PSIF, private sector investment finance to um, private companies. In addition to three major ODA tools, we also dispatch Japanese volunteers, so-called JOCB, Japan Overseas Corporation Volunteers. And also we provide disaster relief. And also we provide uh, business support to Japanese small and medium enterprises working in developing countries. Now I'm talking, I will talk about the um, quite long partnership between India and Japan and JICA. In fact, for India, Japan, JICA is the largest bilateral development partner. And for Japan, India is the oldest and largest recipient of ODA loan. But in addition to ODA loan, now India is the largest recipient of JICA's technical cooperation. As you know, uh, official diplomatic relations were established uh, 70 years ago. Um, the, after six years, the Japanese first all year loan in the world was extended to India. So India was selected as the destination of Japan's first all year loan in the world. Then we started technical cooperation and grant aid. In addition, there was significant assistance in 1991. We provided emergency loan for India's economic crisis. I will touch upon that assistance later. Then 1997, uh, one of the most important projects under the JICA's cooperation was started. That is Delhi Metro. The, our assistance to Delhi Metro was started um, 25 years ago. At that time, India's, um, the GNI, National Income Per Capita, was just 410 US dollars. At that time, there was a lot of, you know, objections uh, within Japanese government, within JICA, because it's still, India was a country at that time. And some people say it was too early to start metro construction, but actually it was not too early. That was shown in the current quite great network of metro um, railways in not only Delhi, but also other major cities in India. Then, uh, unfortunately, 1998, the provision of New Odia loan to India was suspended after two nuclear tests. But after several years, uh, we um, resumed our cooperation then we further expanded our operations, including dispatch of volunteers, which have been started after um, 27 years gap. And recently we have provided two um, COVID-19 crisis response emergency support loans. Now, Let's take a look at the um, historical uh, trend of the JICA's ODA loans to India. 
Uh, you can notice the say uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, our cooperation to India was not so much. Uh, we reached a 100 billion Japanese yen uh, benchmark in 1990s, uh, 30 years ago. Then there was some um, gap around 1998 to 2000 because of nuclear test, as I said. But thereafter, you can notice quite drastic increase of our loan, our assistance to uh, India. The reason is um, in 2006, as you know, the strategic global partnership between India and Japan was agreed by both governments. That was the starting point of the increasing trends of our ODA loan assistance to India. Now, the annual commitment to India is between 300 to 400 billion uh, Japanese yen, which is by far the largest recipient country for JICA. Such increasing trend is the case not only with ODA law, but also with our technical cooperation. Technical cooperation includes dispatch of Japanese experts to India, and also we receive um, Indian government officials to Japan for training. You notice um, the around 2009, 2010, the increasing trend was started. In fact, now the India is the largest recipient of technical cooperation. Um, the amount is almost eight to 10 um, billion Japanese yen annually. Do you know why the such increasing trends happened around 2008 to 2009? The reason was before 2008, there were two different um, public organizations responsible for ODA under government of Japan. One is JICA, uh, which is responsible for Tinker Corporation. The other one is um, JEBIC, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Uh, taking care of all the loans. Those two organizations were merged into JICA uh, in 2008. Thereafter, we you know, started more strengthened cooperation between all the loans and technical cooperation. That is the reason why uh, we also increased our technical cooperation to India, not just all the loans. Now coming to uh, the sector-wise breakdown, um, the historically, there are three major sectors, transportation, energy, and water and storage, maybe followed by industry and forestry and agriculture. That is quite historical trends. But if we take a look at the uh, sector breakdown during the last 10 years, it's quite different. Now, transport is the by far the largest. Um, historically, transport less than half of our ODA loan to India, but during the last 10 years, it's two thirds. Two thirds of our cooperation is now for transport sector. The reason is um, metro construction is underway under JICA's assistance dedicated freight corridor. I will touch up on this project later. Roads and high-speed railway. These are the significant projects in transport sector. And that you know, um, increased our commitment to transport sector quite significantly. Now, um, second topic, um, JICA's noticeable cooperation project in India. Of course, we have to start with transport sector because it um, covers two thirds of our assistance to India. Metro. Um, in fact, Delhi Metro is the most um, famous JICA's cooperation to India, but our first cooperation to metro sector 
was for Kolkata in 1983. But unfortunately, uh, it was not successful because project has been significantly delayed and also ridership, the number of passenger was uh, far below the initial plan. Then there was some gap, almost 10 years. Then uh, we started our cooperation to Delhi Metro in 1997. That was quite significant success. And that project was replicated to um, big cities in India, including uh, Bangalore, Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Chennai, and also again to Kolkata. Now we are expanding our cooperation to uh, tier two cities, including Patna. Delhi Metro. Do um, you know why Delhi Metro was quite successful and that was replicated to other cities in India? I think there are three factors uh, for success. One is um, the implementation structure. Delhi Metro was implemented um, the under MOUD, Ministry of Urban Development, which is now uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Um, and also the project was implemented uh, under the partnership of central government and uh, state government. That is um, quite a significant factor because Kolkata Metro was implemented, the Ministry of Railway. So, so that model was not so successful. So we changed it. Um, this implementation structure in Delhi Metro. That is the first factor of success. Second factor is transfer of Japanese culture, punctuality and safety. And in the first phase of Delhi Metro, um, Japanese construction companies were heavily involved in construction and they promoted the such safety and punctuality and phase one project was completed um, on time, in time, because of efforts by Japanese companies. And third factor is because of the leadership. Um, you must have heard about uh, Dr. Sridharan. He was a uh, managing director of Delhi Metro from 1995 to 2012, uh, almost uh, 20 years. It's quite continuous and very strong leadership. Um, that is always very important factor for you know, any successful business, successful project, but that was also the case in Delhi Metro. And Delhi Metro has contributed um, the improvement of traffic congestion. And as I said, the construction culture innovation, thanks to Japanese company, alleviation of air pollution, and finally, social change. Let me um, explain more detail about social change. Um, there's quotes um, below these photos. That is quotes from a World Bank report, which was published a um, few months ago, South Asia Economic Focus Spring 2020. It focuses on gender, women, um, Delhi Metro introduced priority seats and women only curves. And such efforts have contributed um, the uh, betterment for women a lot. So that World Bank report analyzed um, the impact of infrastructure or women. You can read it. Uh, fear of sexual harassment while commuting to work discourages women's employment and lower their human capital investment due to safety concerns, as well as an entrenched norm about importance women's purity and its connection with family honor. That is the case in South Asia and also in the, including India. Infrastructure changes can generate direct benefits for women. Improvements in transportation infrastructure have the potential to improve women's outcome. And Delhi Metro is quoted in the report as the one very strong example for um, increasing uh, women's participation 
in 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 the workforce so now uh i'll explain two more projects in transport sector dedicated fed corridor um, between delhi to mumbai um, this is um, this aims to um, segregate passenger train and freight train. Then um, the the you know in the later we can increase the capacity of transport of passenger and freight. Um, the that project is one of the largest uh, ODA loan projects in the world, and the project is almost completed. Uh, it's it's partially operate, operating, partially the, it started a partial operation, but it will be pretty completed pretty soon. High speed railway between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. This is also one of the most famous projects in India. Uh, this aims to export Japanese um, high speed railway, red train, uh, Shinkansen to India and most important project for government of India and government of Japan as well. The first loan to high school railway was provided in 2018. Initially, we faced a lot of difficulties, but now construction is in full swing. First sector. This is quite unique uh, sector. And the JICA has worked for first sector uh, over the 30 years. And uh, our corporation has covered all of 28 states. And the JICA is the largest um, development partner in first sector by far. Um, this is quite unique. Uh, we have been working not just afforestation, because afforestation is important. Uh, but in addition, we have been working for uh, women's empowerment, um, climate change mitigation, biodiversity conservation, livelihood improvement, um, technology-based management and monitoring using digital and information technologies, and also disaster um, prevention. Water sector. This is the map of JICA's cooperation in water sector. You notice there are a lot, a lot, because water shortage in urban areas is quite serious. And also um, pollution in rivers and lakes are also quite serious issue in India. That's why we have uh, spent a lot of um, resources for this sector to improve water supply facilities and the storage facilities and also capacity development of government officials. You can notice our assistance, our cooperation covers um, the many important cities, including Delhi, um, Agra, Amritsar, Jaipur, Chennai, Baranasi, and Bangalore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we continue to provide um, such such large scale assistance because of significance of water issues in India. Now, private sector development and human resource development. IIT Hyderabad. You know, before two thousand eight, there were just seven IIT. But government of India decided to increase the number of IIT. And 2008, 2009, additional eight IIT were established. Hyderabad was one of them. And JICA has provided quite comprehensive um, assistance to IIT Hyderabad, including construction of new campus, procurement of high-end research equipment, research and development, human resource development. And of course, in partnership with um, the Japanese universities, 12 
um, University in Japan uh, concluded partnership agreement with IITH. And also a uh, lot of graduates from IIT are now working in Japanese companies. And a lot of students also are now studying in Japan. And IIT Hyderabad is now ranked seventh out of 970 universities um, in, in Indian university ranking. It's quite comparable to um, those IIT established before 2008 and 2009. I think JICA is, is quite proud of uh, such significant success of IIT Hyderabad. Human resource development for the manufacturing sector. Um, that is also quite unique um, program. Um, the, this um, two cities, two programs um, aim to create visionary leaders skilled to transform Indian manufacturing. And the, um, we introduced management concepts of Japanese manufacturing to India. Professor Shoshiba, who is the uh, chief advisor for this um, our program, was awarded for Padma Shri Award from Government of India. And almost 5,000 executives have completed um, the program. Tamil Nadu Investment Promotion Program. This is another quite unique program. This is not um, the cooperation to infrastructure development, but this is in fact the policy lending, so-called policy lending. Um, the, we put certain conditions for policy improvement by state government. And once such conditions are met, we provide the uh, funding to the state government. And state government can use those money for infrastructure development. You know, so, so policy improvement comes first. You know, th this is quite a unique program. And that program was implemented in very close collaboration uh, with Japanese companies and also um, the Japanese public organizations, including um, JETRO. So um, you can understand the target and program composition in, in this slide. And because of success of this um, Tamil Nadu investment promotion program, so-called TNIPP, uh, we um, carried out phase two of TNIPP. And also um, in Gujarat, we have implemented um, the similar program in 2017. JICA's business support Japanese uh, small and medium enterprises. Um, now, uh, we study uh, almost 18 projects. It's quite a significant number. You can understand that many Japanese SMEs are quite interested in doing business uh, uh, in India. We provide assistance to them. Now, Northeast region development. Um, this is the area uh, in which we have been strengthening our cooperation because of um, the Act East policy announced by um, Prime Minister Modi in 2014. Um, a, a flagship projects in this um, Northeast uh, region development is Load Network Connectivity Improvement Project. So far, we have provided uh, six loans to such uh, improvement of national highways. And such cooperation, such assistance contributed to connectivity improvement within Northeast region, but also connectivity with neighboring countries, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Bhutan. And in Bangladesh, JICA has been cooperating um, for the transport sector including uh, development of very big port, deep sea port in Matavali area. That is the south of um, Chittagong, which is now called Chotogram. And we also um, provide cooperation to the road improvement from Matavali port to Chotogram to 
the border with India. So this, you know, such connectivity cooperation in India and in also Bangladesh have huge potentials for connectivity improvement, um, you know, beyond the borders. In fact, uh, now government of India and government of Bangladesh are carrying out pilot program of transit from the eastern part of India to northeast of India through Bangladesh. Now pilot phase is underway, and I hope that the such you know transit will be carried out in full swing in the near future, because that contribute both you know uh, northeast region in India and also Bangladesh and JICA continue to provide uh, you know big cooperation to do such initiative. This is the final um, example of JICA's noticeable cooperation to India. In um, 1991, India faced depletion of its foreign exchange to the crisis level. Um, JICA provided an emergency loan of 300 million US dollars, which was provided uh, within the matter of weeks. It's, it's quite significant cooperation. Still many Indian government officials or you know, um, politicians remember such cooperation. And many still say, you know, quite, Big appreciation to Japanese cooperation to, to, to almost 30 years ago. Final topic <clears throat> development challenges in India and JICA's uh, future cooperation. This is the, our understanding on India's needs for development in the future. There are at least four issues poverty and low level of social services, inadequate infrastructure, lack of skilled workforce and management level human resources, and complicated and inconsistent government regulations procedures. Um, JVIC study on Japanese company doing business in India also reflect um, such problems, our understanding on the problems in India. You can see uh, almost half of Japanese companies uh, indicated poor infrastructure as a big problem. Also unclear government regulations and procedure, again, half. And a third of Japanese companies complain about complicated tax system. And quarter of Japanese companies complain about unstable safety and social environment, lack of management level stuff. So you can understand infrastructure, you know, government, um, capacity building, these are very important uh, issues for future development in India. And let me draw attention to another issue, that is manufacturing. Um, as you know, the uh, India is um, seeing quite large increase of young population. And those big number of young people are coming to the um, job market. So we have to provide the employment to those people. Manufacturing sector is a really key to provide employment for those youngsters. But as you understand that the share of manufacturing in GDP in India, quite significantly lower than um, other countries, um, China or Southeast Asian countries. So we have to increase the, we have to strengthen the government of India have to strengthen uh, manufacturing sector and, and make in India policy. Uh, that is quite a significant contributor for, for such initiative. This is the final slide. Um, our future cooperation. The, our objectives of cooperation is three pillars, sustainable and inclusive growth, strengthening industrial competitiveness, enhancing connectivities. And we will work for five sectors, urban development, including metro, roads, water supply sanitation, railway development, including high-speed railway um, metros, rural development and environment improvement, including agriculture and forestry, private sector development, including um, private sector, you know, our cooperation to private sectors, and maybe we can replicate 
KNIPP type of assistance to other states and human resource development. And finally, development of Northeast regions. So for India, I'm sure that Japan, JICA, continue to be the largest bilateral development partners. And for Japan, India continues to be the largest recipient of all the loan and technical cooperation. So JICA will further work um, for development of India and partnership between um, Japan and India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your informative session, uh, Ichiguchi-san. I definitely feel that a nation individual cannot do an everything, but together we everyone can work stronger to make a Japan-India relation bond more stronger. Uh, from now, I would like to open a question and answer session. So those who has questions, please uh, raise your hands and uh, I'll take the name. With this, I would like to ask one question that uh, we have seen uh, what are the other development projects we uh, JICA has for India in history. But from now, what are the future development projects JICA has for India? Um, yeah, there is uh, still um, ongoing large scale projects. One is the high school railway and the metros. Uh, including Delhi and the other cities. And I think we will allocate quite a significant amount of future assistance for, for those projects. But in addition, as I said, there are uh, you know, four or five other areas, including um, forestry agriculture, particularly that sector is important for climate change mitigation, and also Northeast, um, that continue to be our focus area. And don't forget about private sector development. We have you know the tools to provide cooperation assistance to Japanese private companies working in India. I think these could be the areas of our future cooperation. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, yes, Siddharth-san. Um, good evening, Ichibis-san. Siddharth Deshmukh uh, from Indo-Japan Business Council. Another day we've missed the opportunity to talk, but today, Finally, we are able to see and talk. Thank you very much. We are honored to have you on the IJBC platform and you today shared a excellent data and a lot of development perspective from the Japan and JICA uh, side to the India. I would like to know, uh, have your comments on two uh, areas. Definitely one is very close to my heart because which is I have been following for a long is Delhi Mumbai uh, business corridor. Mm -hmm. We see the lot of things happening uh, in one thing that is, I mean, we hear is uh, Shinkansen, the bullet train, but it also have a freight corridor. It also have some other uh, green um, field cities and the road corridor also. So, uh, I would like to know some updates from JICA side on this. Of course, I asked the same question to the government of India also. Uh, <laughs> and the second is about, uh, uh, definitely would like to know more about your cooperation in a private sector. That would be quite interesting for IGBC members and IGBC itself, uh, considering we are an industry association. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your questions. Um, for Delhi Mumbai, you may be talking about the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor. Yes. DFIC, which yes. was started almost uh, the 10 years or 15 years ago. Yeah. I think because of initiative of uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow, initially, it was quite large scale initiative. But um, unfortunately, now, we are not doing much. But of course, DFC is you know, underway. DFC is the quite backbone of the MICC. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you know, I don't think there are significant cooperation on that, that DMIC aspect in, 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 you know, um, at present, unfortunately. But of course, you know, still uh, there are a lot of you know, scope of our cooperation for investment promotion, investment uh, promotion in that Delhi Mumbai area. So as I said, there was um, 
the project called TNIPP, uh, we may replicate such cooperation in other states for in, in maybe DMIC area yeah. uh, for improvement of investment climate and also um, getting more Japanese company coming to, to those states. Secondly, for private sector, yes, um, the, we are paying more attention these days to our um, the, another tool called PSIF, Private Sector Investment Finance. Mm -hmm. um, this is not new tool, but the, that PSIF was suspended for almost 10 years because of some problem. Mm -hmm. But we resumed such, using such tool 10 years ago. Then it is increasing now. The last fiscal year, our commitment for that PSIF is almost 100 billion Japanese yen. Okay. Still almost, um, you know, the one tenth of our old year long, but still it's increasing and it is getting more significant. So we may use that tool to pr provide direct, you know, cooperation, direct assistance, direct loan to private companies in India and also in Japan. There's is no it specific to any, uh, any, any, any industry or any sector or any area that you will be, I mean, preferential as such? Uh, there's honestly, there's no restriction, but uh, I think there are several focus areas. One is the climate change, of course, and the another one is health. Uh, we're exploring um, the do for our cooperation under PSIF in India. And in this case, uh, how does it uh, uh, operate? I mean, can the private sector approach you or you identify or it's through the state governments only? It's um, the, you know, we are public organizations. Yeah. So when we provide, you know, the loan under PSIF, uh, we need some significance, some meaning. Yeah. And if other say private banks can provide loans, we cannot come in. We need a reason, some yeah. reason, some you know public banks or oh, sorry private banks cannot work alone. JICA's contribution is really required. Such reasoning is really required. Okay. Thank, so you. Thank you very much. If somebody is interested, I think you yeah. may approach to our office in, in Delhi. Yeah. And they, they, can, they can work together. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Sudhir san. Uh, thank you, Ichiguji san, for this uh, insightful presentation. Uh, it was very useful and uh, we came to know a lot of things. Uh, I have one question. Uh, I don't know it fits in JICA's overall mandate or in today's discussion. Uh, my question is, um, uh, how do you see uh, the two countries, India and Japan and JICA as such and private sector in terms of technology? Uh, if I, I don't want to say only IT space, information technology, but beyond that, even more emerging technologies or even life sciences, you know, research, how do you see this planning out and what is the role of JICA could be? Uh, um, we have uh, uh, one sub scheme under Tinker Corporation, uh, so called SATREPS, S A T R E P S. This is quite unique Tinker Corporation because um, the universities, scholars are involved. Our technical cooperation usually involves the Japanese consultants or government officials, but this startups is a kind of research. And we provide uh, some money to Japanese companies in partnership with um, Indian universities to work for some development. And the application should be submitted by Japanese companies, and we accept such application. Then JICA works together with Japanese um, universities for research work, but that should aim to you know um, 
the developing India. Thank you very much. And if if someone uh, need to know more about it, uh, how how to get this information? More oh, about yeah. You, you may communicate to me. Um, the, I can provide to you, of course. Okay. Thank you so much. Or, or I can introduce somebody to you. Yeah, that will help. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much. So overing this now, I would like to go for our next uh, guest speaker, who is a very well-known personality, Ms. Tomo Khawane. Senior Researcher, India-Japan Laboratory, KU University, Japan. Tomokhawane advises government and corporate entities interested in conducting business or setting up industries in India and Japan. She is a senior researcher at India-Japan Laboratory of KU University, Japan. She was born in Tokyo and has lived in India for last 30 years, including four years of post-earthquake in Kutch, Gujarat. She has helped in and guided activities of several NGOs for the benefits of people in need in the areas of health, education, and vocational training. She has written her thesis on Gandhian philosophy. She got selected as an ICCR scholar at AME in International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi in 1992-1994. She researched on voluntary sector and development in India for MPhil and in politics a political science from Maharaja uh, Sayajirav University of Baroda. Post Gujarat earthquake of 2001, she assisted JICA in Gujarat and coordinating Japan Disaster Relief JDR team sent by Government of Japan. Consulate General of Japan at Mumbai invited her as their first external consultant to expand their funding program for uh, grassroots organization in Western India. She helped in local coordination for Dr. Nakao Fukami's architectural survey in post-quake uh, Kutch, as well as the coastal areas of Gujarat. Japanese is her mother tongue, but she is a proficient in Indian languages, especially in Hindi and Gujarati. She has also worked as an expert for People Linguistic Survey of India, PLSI, the first comprehensive all-India linguistic survey on the language spoken in India. So today, she is going to give some highlights on voluntary actions in India. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, and now I'd like to share my screen. It's visible. Okay, it's visible, right? Yes. Just a second. Uh, yes. So good evening today. Uh, I'd like to talk about my experience of uh, voluntary actions in India on grassroots initiatives and interactions. And, I and, and I'd like to thank uh, IGBC for inviting me for this occasion. And this is a joint project with IGBC as well as IJL, Keio University, Japan. So uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, talk about today's theme of my presentation. It's about experiences and lessons through grassroots initiatives and interactions, as well as voluntary actions in India, that to give us an insight about India's new challenges, potentials, and innovative approaches that can help Japan to increase cooperation in India in the years to come. So especially uh, my interaction with uh, youth in India of various nationalities, uh, through that experience, I'd like to talk about today's topic. So uh, studying at the higher educational institutions, my life in India uh, started in 1992 at JNU and later on at MS University of Baroda in Gujarat. And uh, I have met uh, so many brilliant Indians in all quarters of life throughout my stay and life in India. And uh, also uh, in the field of social work, I have met truly selfless volunteers at the time of disasters, especially the uh, 2001 Gujarat earthquake. In that aftermath, I helped JICA to coordinate medical 
uh, emergency relief in the district of Kutch, where actually I stayed back for about uh, four years to offer further help in terms of medical help, education, and also vocational help. So in that experience, I have uh, coordinated volunteers and also I myself joined as volunteers, as well as I have coordinated volunteers from uh, different kind countries, especially from Japan. And in this experience, I have learned that sewa actually means a good coordination to bring out the best out of stakeholders and also mobilize resources. So that is also uh, to find talent and also time and also skills of different individuals and uh, try to seek for help from different associations and make sure that we will always get uh, support and also understanding from administrators in the local areas and also to work along with volunteers in the capacity of um, imparting education always, as well as learning uh, from their own experience in local areas. So uh, what actually volunteer means, <clears throat> we often think about, so that is uh, like uh, full services with free will. So in English, we say voluntary, or in Latin word, we say voluntas, and actually it means free will. Really sorry to interrupt you, Kavanesha. Yes. The slide yes. show is not moving on. It's only, okay. we can see only one slide. Oh my, okay. Okay. Is it visible now? It About is now? not on slideshow mode. Ah, okay. It's not on slideshow mode. Just say yes. Ah, uh, okay. I think it just got stuck. Just a second. Is it visible? <laughs> the screen is visible, but it's yeah, 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 yeah. But it's sorry, it's uh, okay. Is it visible now? No. Can you see? I can see your screen. I can see the slide of August two thousand twenty twenty two. And okay. I can see the whole presentation slides on the left side. So it's not on okay. The actually, you anymore. know, if uh, I make it as a screen, then it doesn't come because actually I'm in a village and it, I have some uh -huh. uh, yeah network issues. So can I just uh, uh, share screen as uh, you know it is shown? It is seen. Yes, sure. It is okay. I'm very sorry for this. Is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay, very sorry. So I have to carry on like this. Very sorry because I'm not uh, at the right place right now for uh, giving lecture. So August 22, uh, we still have uh, our voluntary camp and our journey is on. And currently uh, we are uh, coordinating with volunteers to paint the different school walls by uh, requesting some artists from France to paint. And this is like a breaking walls by painting walls, we name it. And uh, we have been painting different kinds of foods from uh, different kinds of countries. And this is of course, uh, food from uh, India. And there are various volunteers who are painting their own country food. This is like uh, the case of French food. And also uh, we are building walls by making bricks. And this is like a um, group of volunteers from abroad, as well as uh, those who are studying in India, they come together and uh, making a sand baked brick right now. Is it moving? And further, uh, we are always working together to make sure that uh, we have good communication with people. Though we may not be having a, a common language, we try to 
uh, understand each other. And also in the evening, we normally have exchanges with the local children and the local uh, men and women at the meeting hall. And there are some other activities which we do. And in Japan, uh, we try to inform people about different uh, Indian classical dance and music and uh, different kind of uh, culture. So uh, this is one example where uh, we perform the Katak dance in the quake affected area of Ofunato with the local coordination and support of one local MPO. And back to the village, we conduct the different workshops for craft making along with a girl student. And they are mostly from uh, tribal areas and also uh, backward areas where there are no uh, schools within their uh, walking distance. So the girls are uh, accommodated in the school hostel where uh, they can learn how to live together and also study together. And at the same time, as a recreational activities, we offer uh, such extra classes to the girls. And here are some boys uh, who are also staying in the house. And there also we try to create opportunities for them so that uh, they can learn how to make crafts and also spend their uh, extracurricular time with uh, uh, engagements with uh, lots of volunteers from a local area as well as abroad. We often visit uh, uh, villages and to understand the local requirements and uh, also sometimes we receive Japanese companies to be able to understand, for them to understand uh, our kind of local situation, especially in rural areas and the kind of uh, um, their digitalization especially. So this is one of the visit uh, we have hosted. And in COVID-19 relief for rural widows in 2020, uh, we had actually uh, supported nearly 3000 uh, widows. And that is also uh, quite a task for us uh, because at the time uh, we were not able to contact so many people and uh, each uh, house of these women, these widows, have been uh, visited by our local volunteers, those who came from uh, schools and also uh, daycare centers for the young children and local village council members, as well as some school children who volunteered to take part in requesting the ladies to receive help from us. So uh, mostly we offered them hygiene kits, including some masks, because uh, they hardly had any proper protection, uh, if you can look at these photographs. And also we offered um, sanita san sanitation materials, such as soaps and hand sanitizers, so that they will be able to look after themselves, not to get affected by COVID-19. So uh, whenever we complete uh, one voluntary work, it always opens a door for a new relationship. And we try to always inform local people so that uh, people will be able to come forward to let us know about their neighbors. And also at the same time, it gives them opportunity to learn about uh, what kind of issues they have in the locality. And that will actually help them to uh, step forward to give some more uh, helping hands. So this is, uh, these, these kind of activities have been happening in the, uh, like a range of one or two villages, but we have reached so many villages. I think uh, right now more than 70 villages we have covered in the district of Banaskanta. It's in North Gujarat. And the connection of helping hands have been um, extended further by other organizations. 
And this is a, like a record of the meeting just happened two days back. It's from uh, uh, one organization based in Bangalore. They are helping rural organizations as well as uh, urban um, uh, backward schools to be able to get proper education through online education mode. So they have collected uh, so many volunteers and this time uh, I have requested them to find the good English teachers. So they have selected two English teachers, one from Delhi, another one from Ahmedabad. Then we are just having a group discussion whether they can be able to share uh, some burdens of teaching English classes for rural children. And we are also sharing the information about the background of the children and also the kind of modules they can find and could be good for the children. And uh, especially we have been keen to promote such uh, initiatives in coming years because once uh, we have proper basic education and after that, the children in rural areas are still, I mean, quite able to uh, enhance their possibilities to study further and they are not uh, uh, becoming a burden of the family. So their self-value and uh, uh, self-respect also increases. So in each village, wherever we visit, we make sure that we will look after uh, some basic needs of uh, children who are studying in school uh, from standard one to standard eight. And these are the set of items we normally prepare for each child. And it would be just costing for about 500 yen, but we could still give a lot for the children to uh, look after themselves, their studies, as well as their self hygiene. And these are uh, basic 12 items which we offered for uh, children in uh, Gujarat. I think more than 2,000 children we have covered. And this COVID-19 relief for rural children, we basically focused on education and hygiene. And this kind of uh, small help is quite necessary because at that time, uh, now it is uh, now we are already out of the peak of uh, the pandemic. But at that time, at the peak of the time, they were not even able to go out of the home. And also at the same time, they were asked by the teachers to keep on studying at home. But uh, they didn't have the access to educational materials. So it was very difficult for them to even ask their parents to uh, get go to the market and uh, bring such things for them. So uh, we have uh, used the uh, ambulances, which we have uh, at an institution, then try to offer all these materials to the children who didn't come to the school during the pandemic time. So uh, by offering some very basic requirements for education as well as health, we have seen there is a marked improvement about uh, these four points. Uh, number one is self-dignity. And number two is self-care. And number three, this is, I think it's most important to change the society. It's community health. Then self-reliance, sense of self-reliance is very important to be developed among the community because uh, they think it is possible themselves uh, by offering or like uh, taking care of small uh, daily uh, habits or daily learnings, then uh, it is possible to change uh, uh, drastically in terms of uh, receiving uh, kind of like uh, getting infected by such uh, pandemic, epidemic, and also to be able to sustain their educational activities on a daily basis. So uh, through these kind of activities, I have met a uh, numerous number of people at different villages and always felt that what is important is one step at a time. And we normally go to those villages if it is possible by walking 
so that we will be able to understand the kind of realities people face. And it is quite important to see that uh, while you are working in the village, you will always be inquired by the villagers, passers-by who are working or who are uh, just, uh, just uh, passing nearby to be able to like uh, have small exchanges. So they will inquire about you while you're doing this and then you will re reply to them that what they are doing. And uh, so these kind of small communications are there. So that will be uh, very helpful to understand the local situation. And also, I understand that if you can take people around you along, it will be good for the society and community. Uh, I find that uh, through these kind of small initiatives, uh, lots of local people told us that we they actually did not know that there are such so many widows in their localities and they are not actually seeking help from uh, other people in the villages. So uh, that is also a kind of revelation for them. And uh, after uh, such offers uh, being done by uh, us and also other organizations, most of the time, it was local people who came forward to do the subsequent help after we leave. Or they tried to coordinate uh, whatever they could keep from their side to be able to match with what we offer. So here I actually see the potentials of voluntary work as a part of youth exchange. And uh, probably we could uh, propose to universities to plan for a workable program for say group of five students who can work together in the village and working together in the village as well as dining together and also having mini excursions to surrounding villages and which could last one or two weeks duration. Then uh, at the end of the uh, kind of voluntary work, then we can have some concluding uh, exchanges or probably have some presentations to understand and also uh, the local issues and to think about what could be possible to solve such issues. And here, uh, through my experience, I felt that what is important for us, like uh, especially people from uh, Japan to understand India is to understand the realities. In our communication, like now also we are talking in English and exchanging views in English, but to understand the realities, we need to see that who actually has a voice to speak when you actually go to the field and who has a voice to be heard when you actually go to the families. So most of the time, uh, even at the time of disasters, I have seen that the how um, vocal people in languages such as English or Hindi could get better attention or probably uh, be able to be able to extract uh, more support from various organizations. So it is very difficult for some vernacular organizations who have existed and also worked for years for the villagers to come forward and present themselves so nicely and beautifully so that they will get uh, uh, good notice and also good support. Uh, this was my observation. So uh, probably uh, we need to pay more attention to these uh, first two points. And also a uh, third point, one success uh, from a community has a tripling effects. So just one success from a community has tripling effects. It means like, uh, uh, okay, if we keep on uh, trying to offer basic education to a particular school or a particular village, you will see a drastic change, say after five years, six years, or probably 10 years or 20 years later on. So I have uh, worked in the same areas for nearly 25 years till now. So now I'm seeing that, uh, you know, whatever you have invested in education or invested in time and money for 
exchange of uh, uh, different kind of people from different kind of educational background, they have they tend to have more uh, openness towards uh, getting higher education. And also once uh, uh, one or two boys and girls have um, shown their capacity to excel and that community tries to you uh, know replicate the same uh, education or like uh, trying to learn from that family that the work could be done for their own children they have like community learning in the sense so that means that uh, they have quite an impact once you see such kind of achievement and the fourth part uh, currently the biggest barriers in rural area is the digital divide and this need to be uh, tackled and especially the access to uh, like a mode of education probably uh, in rural areas most of the families may have one or two uh, smartphones but they may be only used by the main uh, bread bread owners that means uh, pro probably a most likely male member of the family so uh, the children especially female children do not have the uh, free access to such uh, di digital dev digital devices so that to further uh, delay the opportunities of uh, getting uh, proper education so uh, i hope this kind of uh, aspect need to be looked after by uh, looking after some means for social innovation and the uh, used exchange so uh, where India and Japan can collaborate, I have uh, four points from my experience. And one is to create youth innovation forum where uh, Indian youth and Japanese youth can have free exchange of ideas. And also two, uh, we should have bilateral MOUs with Indian and Japanese educational institutions so that more and more exchanges and more and more uh, communications could happen between Indian and Japanese scholars as well as students. And number three, we need to introduce Japanese language as a third language at schools in India. So far as I understand, uh, we are quite uh, late in promoting Japanese languages because uh, Back in 2010, I could see my city, Ahmedabad, has lots of students who are coming to learn to learn uh, French and German at their own institutions. But currently, in each state, Japanese language language institution, properly supported by, say, government of Japan are non-existent. That is what we have missed to build. That is why I would, I would say uh, with the confidence that that is a thing that we have been quite, uh, um, how should I say, delayed in terms of uh, being able to communicating with Indians and also trying to uh, like uh, request them to come and study in Japan. Because uh, even today, I have been often asked by parents and children and those whom I happen to meet in the, on the different occasions at different meetings, whether I teach Japanese or not and why it is happening. Because there is always a lack of formal established institutions in each state of India, where we could provide proper Japanese language education. So that actually has caused lots of issues because uh, those who may not have much idea about how to reach uh, source of uh, like a Japanese language education, say online resources, we have plenty uh, prepared by Japan foundations, the excellent ones. So they go to um uh, probably not sufficiently qualified uh teachers so that may not be having giving them good experience 
So they give up in between and they will always try to find uh, some means to study in Japan uh, in English. But I hope um, that they, they will come that we can jointly create such Japanese language institutions in each state of India. And the fourth one is to create more opportunity of interactions between Indian and Japanese youth to share projects together in both countries. And for that, lots of uh, effort have been already going on. And I am not uh, uh, able to mention each and every one, but these are the four points where we can collaborate. And I'm sure that uh, we are on the right path. And uh, I'd like to thank that uh, today I had an opportunity to talk about uh, what I have learned and what I'm thinking after having uh, worked in India for the last 30 years. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Tomukhanisan. It indeed it is a great job you are doing in Gujarat for the volunteering work. It's it's really great and hats off to your work. Uh, now we would like to open a question and answer session for you again, and would like to raise your hands to ask the questions. Uh, yes, Tachi Banasa. Hi. Hi, Yarashko. Konnichiwa. 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 <laughs> Today I'm joining the seminar from Hiroshima, Japan. So can I speak with Kawane Sensei in English, uh, in Japanese? Ah, Nihonko de Dozo. Hi, I know. それで、あの、私が初めてインドに行ったのも1990年です。それで、あの、私ももうインドと関わって <笑> あ、全然オッケーです。そうですよね、一口さん。一口さん。一口さんは聞いていらっしゃいますか。そう、あ、いやいやいや。聞いてます、聞いてますよ。ええ。聞いてます。あの、我々在家の中でインド食べにあの、
They yeah, sit there, they weave, they weave, they weave, they keep on weaving. Then goes to like, uh, you know, the market by bringing the products. And uh, to be able to support such people, support, support such artisan, it's quite important to have long-term concept because uh, these are the artisans who only think of daily wage. They will say, okay, today we got this much, aaj itna kamaya. Tomorrow we will get this much, okay, karo itna milega. But the most important part for your project is to be able to give them some vision so that they will be able to understand what kind of role they have. Because traditionally, and probably currently also, they have been simply used by the middlemen. Now we have middlemen mm -hmm. and women both. Mm -hmm. So urban ladies, urban men, whosoever, I would say that, okay, they come to the village, buy in bulk, sell, but the profit goes to these people. That is quite troublesome. And if they try to sell to the local person from their co own community, probably, it's money stays in the community, but I don't know how much it is equally divided. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it is always important to make sure that by creating such kind of business, you try to connect Indian Japan. And at the same time, to make individual weavers so proud of themselves mm -hmm. so that they will feel, you know, okay, I am the weaver and I'm doing this. Because I, what I have seen in India is people don't care about hand, you know, handicrafts much. Or mm -hmm. if they care about the products, they mm -hmm. don't care about the people who use their hand mm -hmm. to make something. Mm -hmm. So uh, the artisans, mm -hmm. professionals who are using their own skills to create mm -hmm. things years after years and generation mm -hmm. after generations, they mm -hmm. are not given due recognitions. Mm. State government may give them one mm. award, big certificate, but the rest mm. of the days, for 364 days, they may mm. be living at the same penury and same mm. kind of repetitive work. Mm. I wish your project can bring mm. them out of that kind of life. Mm -hmm. And for that, it is very important to have a vision. Mm. And I'm very happy that you happen to be like in this, mm. uh, you know, mm. uh, virtual space. And mm -hmm. you seem to be wearing same similar kind of Indian clothes. That is also mm. quite inspiring. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very happy that, uh, and uh, especially some, I mean, female coming mm -hmm. forward with this kind of project. It's quite encouraging, and I'm very happy yeah. to see. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I'd like to continue to communicate with you. <laughs> Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. <laughs> Mm. Yes, that's fun. Uh, thank you very much, Sachibana fun. Mm. That was a very interesting topic. Uh, I I mm. would like to uh, actually ask what was the question. Uh, you know, I mean, there there could be a, if it is a large scale operation, then maybe there is a different approach. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Naturally. So if I know, uh, what what is the exact question? Uh, and the question was, uh, mm. Hatown uh, has a product, denim-based product. So that could be probably collaborated with, uh, you know, this Indian Kadi denim. So Indian Kadi denim could be probably brought to Japan, or maybe they, be, they will be able to uh, create a kind of product together, product so, creation together. Uh, in, in that case, I if it is, uh, I mean, it, if it is a large scale uh, town industry collaboration or mm. individual uh, project depends if it is individual of course it is good idea to connect with artisan but mm. if it is the idea is to promote the local denim along with indian khadi and try to create a new product or a new kind of uh, material mm -hmm. it would be great that uh, uh, either you can directly connect with the uh, khadi promotion or the khadi in uh, mm -hmm. ministry there is a separate mm -hmm. ministry in india mm -hmm. for khadi promotion mm -hmm. or there are uh, khadi cooperation uh, mm -hmm. for the different states of mm -hmm. course the 
most active state would be the Gujarat, Maharashtra, mm-hmm. uh, western part of the India. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that way, the collaboration is larger mm-hmm. and uh, a meaningful impact. Uh, because as uh, Kawanesan said, that small artisan will think about only very limited, only limited to them. Mm-hmm. But if you mm-hmm. want to introduce a new Mm -hmm. Uh, think and if you want to collaborate between the two communities uh, of Mm -hmm. this manufacturer Mm -hmm. it would be better to go to these cooperations or Mm -hmm. ministry, state ministry or central ministry Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm sure Mm -hmm. uh, if you have an attractive proposal they will quite uh, quickly Mm -hmm. pay Mm -hmm. attention, that's my uh, opinion, I think Mm -hmm. that would be the proper approach if it is a big project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, actually, I visited Rajkot of Gujarat. Mm-hmm. There is a big, quite a big organization for Kadi mm-hmm. that, that is uh, Udi Yogi Bharati. Mm-hmm. They are making the denim Kadi under the Arubindo. Maybe Arubindo. Arubindo the, mm-hmm. Yes, Arubindo is the biggest Indian mm-hmm. father of denim. Yeah. So, yes, so they are, they are making amazing Kadim denim, yeah. Kadi denim. But my my project member, one is a denim machine weaving maker, the textile maker. They check, they carefully checking the Kadi denim. That is, a, of course, that is a handmade. So, handmade, I understand handmade. Handmade cannot make like a machine weaving. Right, mm-hmm. but at, but we need minimum quality. So 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 I want I I, I need more. I think the kadi denim improve more by Japanese technique. Right. So yes. in that yeah. case, it will be interesting. You produce uh, create mm-hmm. a project and go mm-hmm. to such a a mm-hmm. big corporation, either private or as I suggested you the local government. Um, mm-hmm. you know, corporations mm-hmm. and propose their um, and offer help first to mm-hmm. improve the mm-hmm. Indian denim, khadi denim, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. probably you can in, in collaborate. That would be very mm-hmm. interesting for the local corporations mm-hmm. also. Mm-hmm. also. Yeah. yeah, yes. And uh, recently, the khadi is a booming for mm-hmm. Indian young people too. Mm-hmm. They love to using the Indian product, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And yes, all yes, are, yes. Yeah, all around the world, the nationalism, mm. <laughs> right? So you, yes, you, yeah. Mm. I have I have one comment on this part. Um, mm. There is a university established by Mahatma Gandhi in mm. Ahmedabad, and mm. where people have to wear these khadi mm. products. Oh, khadi, khadi products. I mean, those who are coming to study there are all mm. most all from rural areas mm. and not mm. able mm. to have you know expensive clothes. Mm. But now khadis. Mm. Closings have mm. become so expensive, and for them, yeah, it's a yeah. burden. It's a mm. burden, huge burden to buy such mm-hmm. uniform, mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. though you know it is a compulsory. But now, now mm. we have to think that the, how this could be possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. such people mm-hmm. to wear that also. Mm-hmm. But I think mm-hmm. uh, uh, what Sidasa has uh, uh, proposed is quite uh, workable, and mm-hmm. uh, to be able to have uh, you know mm-hmm. uh, long term relationship. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. need to have government mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. and also at the same time, we need to involve private parties so mm-hmm. that uh, we can, you know, plan sustainably and mm-hmm. possibly I think JICA will be able mm-hmm. to give us some, uh, you know, mm-hmm. um, do help as well as uh, yeah. guidance <laughs> so that, uh, co- I mean, some collaboration mm-hmm. could be mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, accept, I, I expected that. <laughs> yes, in Japan, we also get the denim in Japan. There are so many items in the online store regarding the Kadi items, but the I researched end user of Japanese, they are not satisfied Kadi qualities because <laughs> the Japanese people having the very keen eyes. So <laughs> yes, so I need to improve the Kadi quality. So all around the world, co- consumer also wanted wanted the Kadi's quality high. So after that, the consumer 
all around the world accepted curry more. So I want to cooperate with that. I expected that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so you. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Do we have any question more? Okay, I don't think we have any more questions, so we can go to the conclusion. And I really would like to give a big thank to uh, Ichiguchi-san and definitely Kawane-san for giving the wonderful presentation and accepted our uh, request for joining our session. And of course, thanks to the whole IGBC team and KU University for organization organizing this lecture. Thanks to our sponsors, tutorbharat.com, Intergest India, the IT Japanese language solution, Nagpur, Fujitsu Consulting India, Japan Center of Excellence, Guwahati, Fox Mandal. Thanks to our event partners, Shimbe Lab, Nanobees, Raven MR, Vaban Company, Ichiban Enterprises, Asian Community News, The Lingo, and K University. These events can happen only because of you. I once again thanks everyone who is directly and indirectly involved in this program. So with this, definitely we can think that when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment, which is which it grows, but not the flower. So in the backdrop of changing these climates and rising frequency and intensity of disaster worldwide, our next session will mainly focus on understanding the contemporary risk scenario and the potential pathways of addressing emerging disaster risk, deliberating on evaluation of disaster management field globally. This session will highlight on complex hazards profiles of India and Japan, while highlighting the areas of shared importance, particularly the relevance of social innovation will be discussed in the context of stimulating sustainable solutions to solve the current social problems. We, uh, the speakers are the Professor uh, Rajiv Shaw, Graduate School of Media and Governance, KU University, Professor Anuja uh, Guroto, Indian Institute of Science. So this session will be held on uh, 15th of October, 2020-22, 4 p.m. IST, 7.30 p.m. JST. For registration, please go through our website, www.igbc.org. So till then, stay connected and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.